Can I start with a funny story? I wasn't going to start with this, and I've got notes because um, we've got to get through a lot this morning through our culture of heaven uh, theme this morning of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts. But can I just tell you a story that I just thought was funny? And for some reason during worship, it came to mind. So uh, I think it must have been about five years ago, I was at a conference in London. Um, it's a big, huge, popular leadership conference. And um, we were in uh, a time of worship, and uh, the uh, Holy Spirit uh, was, was doing his thing, uh, and people were receiving uh, from God. And I was sat in a row, probably about six or seven back from the front, it's a big church, and for some reason, whatever, I think it was middle of the day, um, I was just a bit tired, so I was sat down, and I wasn't really engaging, but I was just watching, enjoying the presence of God, and seeing everybody meet with God, and thinking, this is great, um, I love being in this environment, and I look to my left, and I see um, a man at the end of our row, and he's got both hands extended in the air, and he's got his eyes closed, and he's just worshipping the Lord, okay? and for some reason, he catches my eye, and I don't know why, and I look at him. And I keep looking back, and I keep looking back, and the reason it caught my eye was not him, but it was the lady in the row in front of him who was sat in front. And can I just grab a chair just so you can see? I'm just going to grab this one. So the man is standing like this, okay? So he's here. The chairs are quite close together because it's a big church, and they're trying to pack everyone in. And the man's standing here like this, okay? And he's got his eyes closed. He's worshipping Jesus, loving the time, Holy Spirit, amazing, brilliant. The woman in front having a completely different encounter with the Holy Spirit. She's on the chair, and she's sliding. And as she's sliding, her head goes back like this, okay? So her, head, her eyes are closed. She's looking straight up, okay? And her head is like on the back of the chair. And she's loving it. She's loving the Holy Spirit and all that's going on. The guy, meanwhile, is stood here, okay? And he's looking down. Right? And he's loving it. Now, if you can imagine, her head's there, his head's here, right? And they've both got their eyes closed. And they're both enjoying the Holy Spirit. And I'm sat over here going, I cannot wait to see who opens their eyes first. I cannot wait. I'm like, someone get me some popcorn. I just want to, I'm just watching, okay? So I'm watching. And lo and behold, the woman's like this, okay? She's there, she's loving it, saying all kinds of lovely things. The man... He's like this, okay? And he slowly opens his eyes, and I think, this is it. This is the moment. And he looks down, and he just goes, "Ah!" (laughs) The woman, completely oblivious, the man at the front went, yes, Lord, more, Lord, more, Lord, more. (laughs) From his outburst, I just thought, that is just hilarious. I was rolling around. Oh, it was so good, so good. Sometimes when God shows up, it's not always what we expect. And he moves in the way that he moves. And so a little bit later on, we are going to pray for people to receive uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it may not look like what you expect it to look like. It may not look like normal New Life Sunday morning, which really gives us quite a big scope of what New Life Sunday morning could look like. Because we're a bit odd, right? And things like that happen. Um, I just wanted to encourage you with that story that God will move and he will do things. And uh, we just need to be kind of ready for what he'll do this morning. So... We are looking at, let me turn this one on, uh, spiritual gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, and what I want to look at is I want to look at what are the gifts uh, um, and why are we given the gifts. Then I want to move on to it's our birthright to hear from the Father. Then I want to talk a little bit about how we use these gifts in our everyday. Because what I didn't want to do this morning was talk about how we use them in church on a Sunday morning. Because we're very good as a church, as a family, to flex our spiritual gifts muscles, if you like. We have people give words, we have people give pictures, um, and like Louise shared this morning about God's love. And we, we flex all of that in church context quite well. We do that well as a family. But I, what I want to challenge you this morning is how do you use that in your everyday when you're in the office on a Tuesday morning and you arrive? How do the gifts of the Holy Spirit work in that context? We're going to look a little bit at that. And then we're going to look at the cost and the risk of following the Holy Spirit in our everyday. So I have a lot to cover because we spent a whole weekend talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and I have a little under 20 minutes to get it all out, okay? So just bear with me, okay? I'm not going to be able to hit all of it. Hazel was praying this morning and she felt that... um, Actually, I, what my words, like God was going to go beyond my words and he was going to share things with you um, that I wasn't going to speak. That actually God was going to speak to you through things that I was not even going to come out of my mouth. And I thought, well, that's good because I don't know if I'm going to be able to cover everything. And so if the Holy Spirit can just move, that would be fantastic. So 
Let's look at the gifts. Can we get the first one up? Yes, brilliant. Okay. Romans 12, 6 to 8 gives us a list of gifts, okay, to start off with. It gives us uh, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement. Now, I love that. I love that one of the gifts is encouragement because when I was at uni, they did that thing where in your little group, they write, you have to write your name on the top and then you pass it to the next person and then they write something lovely about you and then they fold it. And then someone else writes something lovely about you and then they fold it. And in the end, when you get it back, you get this long list of lovely things from people. And mine just said encouragement, just all the way down. You're very, very encouraging. One of them said you're crazy, but the rest of them said <laughs> you're very, very encouraging. And so I love that that is a gift and that we can ask God for the gift of encouragement. Giving, as we were hearing about generosity kind of last week, that is a gift. Leadership and mercy. I'm going to flick through these. We've got more gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verses 8 to 10. We've got, these are known as the the charismatic gifts. So these are the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. A lot of these uh, gifts are the ones that we covered over the weekend at the conference. Um, so if you'd like to know any more about that, go speak to the young people. They are experts. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, a little bit later on, we look at, we have apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, caring and slash helping, which is really good if you're not one of those people who likes to stand at the front and give a word, but actually you'd rather just care for someone. You'd rather help someone. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit in your everyday. Um, administration. I can think of someone straight away who has got the gift of administration. I will not embarrass her, but let's just say the Supernatural Youth Conference would not have happened without the gift of her administration, okay? And uh, and tongues as well. Now, what I do want to highlight also this morning, not only just those gifts, there are loads of other gifts mentioned in the Bible, but I want to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. And the reason I want to talk about them is because I think sometimes... We play them down and we do that thing where, you know, when you get the children and you get loads of fruit and you write the fruits of the spirits and you get out and they go, oh, it's fantastic. And we kind of dumb it down into this being, oh, it's just, they're just nice things. And the fruits of the spirits are what comes out of us as we have the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to put up a list of the fruits of the spirit. These are the things that should be pouring out of you as we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And what I love about these in today is the fact that these are speaking louder than ever before. In a world that we live in, the fruits of the Spirit are starting to shout in a world that we live in. In a world that is full of hate, the fruit of love speaks louder. For a world that is uh, saturated in depression, there is the fruit of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are becoming louder in our everyday Why are we given the gifts? We are given the gifts um, for a number of reasons, but I just want to speak from uh, John. Actually, I forgot to say, if you've got Bibles, please get your Bibles out. We're going to be flicking through lots of different parts. If you've got a paper Bible, if you've got an electronic one, please get it out. We're going to be going through John and Acts and Corinthians, so just keep it kind of open to flick. But I'm going to be looking in John 14, and in John 14, verse 12... I'll give you like 10 seconds to find it. Are you there? Give me an amen if you're there. Okay, there's two or three. Okay. Give me a hold on if you're not there. Oh, oh. So John 14, 12, okay? And we've got Jesus saying this. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and Greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. And what this is saying, Jesus is saying, is that I'm going to go with the Father, and when I go with the Father, the Holy Spirit will come, and you will do greater things on earth than I have done. Why are we given the gifts? To bring the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, to earth. Joel, the book of Joel, Joel 2, 28, prophesies this happening. He says... God will say, I will pour out my spirit on all men, all women, all people. I will pour out my my spirit. This is what Joel prophesies in the Old Testament. Then we get to Acts 2, and this happens. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the, uh, the, the, the followers of Jesus. And we see God's Holy Spirit come. And all that was prophesied before comes to fulfillment. Why are we given the gifts? 
so that we can bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. His gifts are for everyone in our everyday. If you've got your Bible still open, I'd like you to just quickly skip to 1 Corinthians uh, 14 and 3, where we see Paul talking about prophecy and tongues. And um, he's talking a little bit um, about kind of how, what these meant to be used for these gifts. And so in verse 3, he says, On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, their encouragement, and con- consolation. That's the right word. But I've changed it in the translation. In the inner voice, it said the strengthening, the encouraging, and the comfort. So Paul has already given us a, like a, a framework, if you will, of how we use these gifts in our everyday. And so when you get given something maybe at work or maybe at home or even in church and you think, is that from God? Just have a run through these things. Is it strengthening for the, for the body of Christ? Is it encouraging or is it comfort? If you're sticking yourself to any one of those three things, you're doing okay. Or as um, I heard someone recently say, instead of strengthening, encouraging, and comfort, uh, he put it in a really simple way, which is great for me. He said, um, we need to build up, fire up, and hold up. Sometimes we need to build up, sometimes we need to fire up, and sometimes I just need to be held up by a word or a picture from God. Do you know that it is our birthright to hear the voice of the Father? It is our birthright to hear from the Father. If I adopt a child, it is probably expected that I speak to that child and that child will know what I sound like when I speak. And I will get to know that child and that child will get to know me. It is our birthright that we are to hear the voice of the Father. If you've got your Bibles, just skip me to John John 10. And I want to read apart from John 10. John 10, verse 27, says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. I love John 10. I love the fact that Jesus is talking about being the good shepherd, not only to make it relatable to who he's talking to, which is what I also love about how God speaks, is that he makes it relatable to what we understand. But I love the fact that he speaks about himself as the good shepherd. And in verse 3 of John 10, it says, To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. What was made interesting, uh, I heard someone say recently, is that in this context, what he's talking about to the shepherds was, let's say the, uh, the shepherds' union get together one evening and they all go down to the pub and they put all of their sheep, in, if you like, in a big pen, a sheep creche, if you will, and they put them all in and they ran all the sheep in. Now, they don't give the shepherd uh, a ticket. They don't spray paint the sheep. Okay, right, uh, you're, you've got the red spray paint, so we're going to spray paint all your sheep red so that when you come back, you'll know your sheep and you can say, right, that's my sheep, that's my sheep, that's my sheep, let's go. They would just pile the sheep together in one ginormous pen and there would be someone to look after it. When the shepherd was come back, the shepherd would come back and just say, sheep, sheep, follow me. And the sheep who belonged to that shepherd would turn and follow the shepherd. Why? They recognised his voice. And the sheep who didn't belong to that shepherd didn't follow because they didn't know that voice. And it got me thinking about when I grew up, between the ages of 12 and 14, I spent every Friday night, more or less, in Asda. My parents used to do the Friday night shop, okay? And there was a huge Asda where we lived, and they used to take us there for dinner. We used to have dinner in Asda and everything. And they say, right, we'll get dinner. Then we're going to go shop. And I want you guys to just don't leave the shop. You can go wherever you want in the shop. Just don't leave the shop. But just go. We don't want to shop with you. So they used to send us out. And me and my brother used to go, yes, straight to the toy aisle. And this shop, this Asda was huge. And so we'd spend like two hours with the toys. Just like, this is fantastic. Chucking balls. I mean, we were like 
insane. And, um, and then when I got a little bit older, I'd go check out CDs. Remember them? Those disc things? That used to, yeah? And, uh, and then I'd used to go check out... I don't, they're becoming a thing of the past now. Uh, DVDs. And because I'm a man, I would go check out the TVs, the kettles, the microwave, any, any electrical appliance. I'd just go and check it out. And um, so I spent about two, three years growing up on a Friday night in Asda. I didn't have a really cool youth group with awesome youth leaders uh, on a Friday night. I grew up in Asda. That's where I grew up. And... Um, <laughs> What used to be funny is that after a couple of hours, when my parents were heading towards the tills, my dad, to get us to come to the tills, all he would do is whistle. He would whistle, and his whistle is this. And me and my brother, it doesn't matter where we were in the store, would go, that's dad's whistle, let's go. And we would walk. It didn't matter where he whistled from in the store... We could hear it over all the chatting, over all the music, over all the noise that we were creating ourselves. We would always hear Dad's whistle, and as soon as we heard Dad's whistle, we would go. How mental is that? How does that even work? But we knew Dad's whistle. We knew his voice. When he whistled, we went. It was amazing when I think back of that, and I think that, you know, how do, how do we get to a stage where we even... Like, he used to whistle like four or five hours away, and we would hear it. I mean, has he just got a loud whistle? Yes. But he must have whistled, you know, next to us. Oh, that's Dad, he's whistled. Okay, let's go. Then he probably got a little bit further away. He probably trained this. He probably got a little bit further away and whistled at the end of the aisle. (whistles) Oh, yeah, that's Dad, let's go. Then he probably whistled from the next aisle and the next aisle. But we always recognised it. And one of my uh, life goals is to get to a place where all God has to do is whistle and I instantly recognise it and go, ha, that is you. I'm still on that journey, but one of my life goals is that he only has to whisper and I hear his voice. Often when I think about uh, wanting to hear from God, um, I think that I turn up to church and I close my eyes really tight and I clench my fist and I'm like, God, will you just speak to me? God, will you speak to me? God, will you speak to me? I want something this morning either for myself or for the church or anything. Will you speak to me? And I've come to this revelation recently that the more I try, the less I hear. And actually, the power is in his presence. When he speaks is when I seek his presence. And I've got a little book here called Everyday Supernatural and it's Mike, uh, by Mike Pilavacci and Andy Croft. And I just want to read um, a story in which they talk about being in God's presence. And so uh, Mike says this. He says, Some years ago, I was in a prayer and worship meeting and found myself sitting next to an elderly lady. We were singing Psalm 134 and everyone was clapping. As the song came to a, a close, everyone stopped clapping except the old lady. After a few moments, she realised that she was the only one and she stopped. Then, uh, she then told the group what happened, that she'd been suffering from arthritis for the past few years. Her hands had been so twisted that she couldn't even hold a cup of coffee. She said, I haven't clapped for years. And as I was worshipping Jesus, I forgot that I couldn't clap. Look, she said, waving her hands. He healed me when I wasn't even looking. Isn't that amazing? The power is in his presence. And um, we can be encouraged by David in the Psalms. In Psalm 27, uh, verses 4 and 5, he says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling and he will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of my days and gaze on the beauty of the Lord. The power, the hearing, the voice is found in his presence. So I would encourage you on whenever we have worship, whenever you're doing your day-to-day stuff, just seek his presence. Um, a number of you may have realized that when I pray for people, um, uh, I don't know, for, for healing or for anything, I will always just pray for more of God's presence. Because in God's presence, he will speak. 
And sometimes I just don't have words, and so I just say, come Holy Spirit, more of your presence, and that's all I have to do. All I have to do. And I'm thinking about this story, and it got me thinking about uh, a story that I've shared with you before, but I'd like to share it again this morning because I'm not too sure if everyone's heard it. However, it relates really well to this. So about a year ago, uh, me, Alan, and Hazel were at a conference, and we were having a time of worship, and I felt God today to say, this is fantastic, isn't it? And I was going, this is just lovely. The, the environment, the room, God is here, I'm enjoying this. And, um, and there was a lot of wailing and a lot of uh, jumping up and down and craziness. And I felt God say, you don't really want to do that this morning, do you, Tom? And I said, no, I don't really want to do that. He said, why don't you just take a wander? So I started just wandering around and enjoying everything that was going on. And as I'm wandering, I felt God say, stop. So I stopped. And then I heard God say, kneel down. Not in a forceful way of kneel down, but in just a, will you kneel? So I kneeled and I sat there. And for 10 minutes, I sat there going, what next? What is it? What's next? You know, you've told me to walk, you've told me to stop, you told me to kneel. What is it next? What are you trying to tell me, Lord? I'm ready. I'm ready to hear what you're going to say this morning. I didn't say anything. And for 10 minutes, I sat on my knees and just waited until I'd realized that I was sat on my knees. And why that's important is that some of you know my story and some of you don't. When I was uh, 19, I broke my leg. I broke my femur playing ice hockey. And when the surgeons operated, they said, our main goal for your leg is to get it straight, okay? So that when you stand up, you're straight. However, we've had to compromise that your knee won't fully bend. So you can have a straight leg and you can stand up and you can walk, but your knee will only bend so far. And if you can kind of see, I know this might be hard, my knee bent to about here, and that was as far as it would go. So it's probably, you know, it was okay, it was about half. And they said, and the thing is, when you get older, it will get worse because, you know, bones get older and joints and, and, and it'll actually get worse and, you, you know, this is probably as much as you're ever going to bend it. And so I went away really um, upset, I guess, um, and downcast because I thought, this, this is bizarre that I was thinking this at 19, but I was thinking, how am I going to get on the floor with my kids? I don't even have children. I don't even have children now. But how am I going to get on the floor with my children and play if I can't bend my knee? That was the first initial thought that I had. And God knew that. And so I've been uh, receiving prayer for years for my knee. And yet I'm in the worship and I'm sat down on my knees. And I just go, oh, I'm sat down on my knees. Almost like the lady. I can clap. I've been, I completely forgot that I couldn't <laughs> sit on my knees. I couldn't bend back. My leg now is at... I think this level, I've still got a bit to go, God's still healing, and I'm still asking for prayer. But isn't that incredible, that in the midst of his presence, I completely forget that actually God is healing me as I'm worshipping. I have a story um, that happened a couple of weeks ago, and I've been so desperate to share it. But I haven't, because I thought, in a couple of weeks, I'll be doing a talk and I'll share it then. So... This is a good one, okay? So, one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives is the gift of speaking in tongues. And very early on when I received uh, the Holy Spirit, um, the gift of tongues was one of the gifts that he'd given me. Uh, And usually when I use this gift, I use it as a personal devotion, okay? I see it as uh, speaking in tongues as a way of communicating with God that bypasses my head and my mouth, Uh, and having to process it into English words, and it's my soul speaking to God. So when I'm stressed, when I'm lonely, when I'm worried, I will just speak in tongues because it allows me to just open up my spirit to God, okay? And so I'm on the way to work, it's on a Tuesday morning, and I mention it's a Tuesday morning because I want you to realise that this happens in every day, not just on a Sunday. And so on a Tuesday morning, I am... I'm on my way to work, and I've got all these things going through my head, all worries of kind of uh, relationships and, and family, and um, when we're going to live, when we're older, are we going to be able to afford somewhere, are we going to you know, have to start a family, what, all these stuff's going through my head, and the radio is quite loud, and in the end I just go, I can't deal with this, so I turn the radio off, and I just say, Lord, I'm going to speak in tongues, I'm just going to speak, okay, and uh, you're just going to have to... Um, you know, just take all of this, because I'm just so stressed, okay, and so I start speaking in tongues, and usually when I speak in tongues... Um, my tongues are just uh, gobbledygook. I never really pick out a word or a sentence or anything like that. I just, um, I just speak and speak and speak. And I'm okay with that because that's my soul speaking to God. And he then can understand how I'm feeling and I can offload all of this stuff. But on the way to work, I only had one word. 
And it kept repeating and repeating and repeating. I thought, that's strange. And usually, I never usually get just one word. And I never really uh, think about the words or it highlights. But this word kept highlighting to me. And the word was scalmana. And I'm thinking to myself, scalmana, scalmana, what on earth is that? Then the thought pops into my head. Why don't you translate that, Google translate that when you get to work. See what it means. See if it means anything. So I get to church, I get my phone out, and I type in scalmana. And it says Italian to English translation. But it doesn't tell me what it is. It just says Italian to English. So I'm like, okay. So I get up my Google Translate, and I get up the Italian, and I type scalmana, and I click translate. And do you know what the word means in English? Chill. (laughs) Chill. How good is God that he would speak for a word that would be relevant? Chill, as in chill out, Tom. I've got this. I've got you. All this stuff was coming up, was coming up. And all God was saying was chill. He didn't give me any explanation. He didn't tell me anything I needed to do. He just said chill. So now I can put on my CV that I can speak Italian. (laughs) Trust me, I will. (laughs) <laughs> we're going to do a little exercise, um, and I hope you're ready for this, um, because we're all going to hear from God this morning, and we're all going to hear from God right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a little, a little exercise where I need you to get into pairs, okay? So you're going to find someone close to you, and you're going to say, right, you're my partner for this, okay? And we're going to do this together. And what we're going to do is we're going to hear from God. Um, it's a little exercise that when me, Hazel, and Alan went to a conference, they, they got us to do, and it was really helpful. And I do it all the time with the young people, um, and they find it helpful as well. So young people, you already know what's going to happen. So you're going to get you into pairs, and I'm going to give you a scene or a scenario or a picture And what I want you to do is I want you to just think about the first thing that pops into your head. So if I was to give you an example, say the beach, you might think sand. Okay, sand. Sand is something you find on the beach. Then you might think, why has sand come into my head? Lord, why why are you trying to show me about sand? Then it could be, well, actually, you know, God knows every hair on our head and he knows all of the grains of sand. And actually, we might sometimes feel as tiny as a bit of sand, but actually we need to know that... God knows who I am, and we're not just uh, in a sea of all these people. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you the beach, because all of you are just going to say sand. <laughs> but I'm going to give you something else, and in your... Uh, I want you to pray. I want you to say, God, what stands out from that? And then I want you to ask, why does that stand out? Now, if you don't have anything for why, don't panic. Just share what stands out. Because Hazel shared something with me last week, and she didn't quite know what it was meant. But as soon as she shared it, I knew exactly what it was. And that's incredible because God speaks through Hazel to me. She has no idea what it means. I know exactly what it means. And God speaks to me in that moment. So have you already decided who you're going to partner up with? You need to find a pair. Some of you might need to move. We are going to get a little bit practical. We are running out of time because I've got another whole thing to get on. But let's get into pairs in the book of Acts. Look in the book of the Acts, but the book of Acts with the apostles and the followers of Jesus, and just you'll just see countless stories of them using uh, nudges by the Holy Spirit in their everyday. And so, in Acts three, we read about uh, the lame man at the beautiful gate and how um, Peter and John are just walking in. They're going to prayer, and if you like, they're going to church. And as they're walking in. The man is there and he's saying, please, have you got anything for me? And he said, we haven't got anything for you as in terms of money um, or anything like that. But what we do have, we will give to you in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And the man stands up and walks. They are just going to church and the opportunity presents itself to do something. Do not wait to get to church before God needs to move. How often do I drive to church and I'm not aware because I think that I haven't got to God yet? And when I get there, then stuff will happen. When actually, this could be happening on the way. In Acts 5, we read about the apostles. Uh, they, are, they are arrested and they are freed. And they are freed by an angel in the middle of the night. And um, they say to the Lord, what do you want us to do? And, and they say, keep preaching. So they go back into the temple and they continue to preach. And the, the men find them. And they say, hey, we, we arrested you. You should be in jail. We're... And they brought them back before the council. And uh, they're, they're kind of being told off, if you like, um, like seriously told off. And um, what I love about in in Acts 5 is the fact that there's a a Pharisee, um, uh, someone who's quite high up and is honoured by a lot of the guys in the Pharisee. I think it's, uh, is it Gamaliel? Yeah? 
Gamaliel. Ooh, he's got an accent. And um, what I love about his response is he says, hang on a minute. We've had people say that, you know, stuff like this before, and they took men with them, and then they died, and then all, all their followers just dispersed, okay? So um, we've had this before. So what I say is we just leave this alone, because if this is of men, it will just, disin- it will, you know, it will just fizzle out, and it will end. But if it's of God, you will not be able to stop it. And if it is God, you will find yourself opposing God. And what I love about the fact that he realises that actually this is not what I expected it to look like, but this could just be God. And in our everyday, we need to recognise that not everything that God wants to nudge us in will look like how we expect it to look. In Acts 8, we read about Philip and the Ethiopian official. And I love this story because it's literally Philip and his mates going on an evangelistic mission. And his mates go one way and God says, no, Philip, I want you to go that way. And he says, okay, Lord. And he goes that way that God tells him. And as he's going, he finds the Ethiopian official reading the book of Isaiah. And he's saying, does anyone know what this means? And Philip goes, I know what that means. Let me tell you about what that means. He meets him where he's at and he says, let me tell you about Jesus in his everyday. How tempting would it be to just follow his mates to where they were all going. But yet he takes a different path. He follows the God nudge and he says, I will follow and I will go and do what it is you're telling me to do. And the last bit in Acts 10, we have Peter and Cornelius. And we have Cornelius, the Gentile centurion, and he has, a, he has a vision, and he has his vision of to send for Peter. And in the meantime, Peter's getting his own vision, and he's getting this, um, this blanket thing with loads of food, and God's saying, eat. And he's saying, no, no, I can't eat this because it's unclean, and there's whole rules, and it's not unclean. And God's saying, don't call something unclean what I'm calling clean. And, and then these men turn up uh, from Cornelius, and he says, hey, we've been sent by Cornelius. Will you come with us um, to our house? Um, and Peter goes, yes, I feel like I, I, I'm meant to go with you. And he goes with them and he gets there. And then he realises that actually this movement, this faith, this Jesus is for everyone. It's not just uh, for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles as well. And he shares the good news of Jesus with them. Uh, they receive that and then they receive the Holy Spirit. And then Peter has to go back and explain, hang on, this is a load of stuff that's gone on. But it's not what we thought it was going to look like. Which is incredible when you think about the disciples and the followers. They've already got it in terms of Jesus wasn't what they expected. But yet, they still had times when they, God did things and they didn't expect it. On Thursday, when I was mapping out all my notes, I had a phone call at the office. And Carrie said to me, um, there's a guy on the phone for you. And I'm going to use an, an alias of the name because something might come of this. Uh, Steve's on the phone to you. And I said... I don't know if Steve, but okay. Um, put him through, so. Hi. Hi. Um, you don't really know me. I'm Steve. Um, and uh, I just needed someone to talk to. Um, I've got stuff going on in my life. I just feel like I need to get my faith back on track. And I know there's a higher power. And um, I, I've made some bad decisions. And I just need someone to talk to. Uh, and I said, have you got a bit of time? Yeah, I've got a bit of time. Um, tell me about your story. He starts telling me. I quickly find out that this isn't a phone call conversation. This is a we need to meet up for a coffee conversation. And so I offer them, say, hey, should we, we chat a little bit? I said, do you want to come tomorrow? Yeah, great. How bizarre that in the middle of my day as I'm writing that I need to recognise that when God moves in my everyday, it's not always what I expect. Someone phones me out of the blue and just says, hey, I need to talk to someone. Can I talk to you? And I could have just been like, no, sorry, I don't have time. Or carry I'm really busy right now because I was. But God was saying, in that moment, it's not always what you expect it to look like, Tom. Okay, moving on to cost and risk. Can I invite the group up? Because then hopefully they'll kick me off and then we can start praying for gifts. Um, But I just want to talk a little bit about cost and risk, okay? Because there is always a risk and there's always a cost with stepping out with the Holy Spirit, okay? And a lot of the time, the cost is time, okay? It's your time. That's a cost. And the risk is looking silly, because what if I get it wrong, and it's not? Okay, in Acts 2, we read that when the Holy Spirit came, they mocked them and said, oh, they're all just drunk. They're all just drunk. And Peter stands up and says, hey, 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 no, 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 let me explain what's going on here. But they would have looked silly, and sometimes the fear of looking silly can hold us back. At the Supernatural Youth Conference, just a little over a month ago, um, I felt God say, I want you to get up and I want you to call people forward who have headaches. And I'm like, really? 
We've spent a whole, we've spent a year praying for this event. Can you not give me something like praying for someone's leg to be healed? Or, you know, someone's got a bad back or, I don't know, someone's even in a wheelchair. Give us, we want something big and fantastic so that all the young people can go away and go, wow, we went and God did and it was incredible. And yet God says, I want you to just call people forward if they've got headaches. And I thought, that's just so uh, mundane. That's just so not cool. Like, a headache, just take some aspirin or some, do you know what I mean? And I was like... God was like, just say it. And so I was like, oh, okay, I want to call people forward for healing. And if you've got a headache, I feel like you should come forward for prayer. And loads of them came forward. I thought, okay, we're on to something here. And a young boy got prayed for by a prayer team. And um, his headache was instantly healed. And he was amazed. And you know, like, um, if he was acting, he would have won an Oscar. Like, he wasn't acting. He, he'd been healed by God. And um, my friend who was with me just said, you need to jump on this. You need to give him a microphone now. So I gave him a microphone and he stood here as a 12-year-old boy just saying, I just came forward because I have a headache and God just healed me and my head is clear and it's gone. And he then starts evangelizing to all of the other young people about how God heals. But it had to come from of, this is silly, no one's going to come for a pre- low prayer for headache. All the young people are going to be like, oh, such a general prayer. <laughs> Headaches, like everyone's got a headache. And yeah, I just had to step out and do it. I'm coming to the end. I'm coming to a land, I promise. Um, if you get it wrong, nobody dies. Okay? This is a, a, a sentence that, um, that I've heard from, from Mike Pulavachi, and it gives me great confidence to do it because he says, if, if I get this wrong, if I share this and it's wrong, nobody dies, I just look a bit silly, and that's all it is. Okay? And we all just move on. And um, so you may look a bit silly, you may look a bit strange, but no one will die. Fear can be the biggest thing when it comes to sharing. Is it going to be correct? Is it going to be right? Is this person going to understand? Are they going to think, I'm never sitting next to that person again? 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul is saying this to, to Timothy, saying, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And what I love is before that verse, in verse 6, says this, For this reason I remind you to fan the flame the gift of God he has given you. In a simple version, I checked it out, it says, so I ask you to make full use of the gift that God has given you because God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-control. Isn't that cool? So in your everyday, Monday morning, just start asking God, God, what is it you want me to do today? Is it just a small thing? Is it something in the office? Sometimes you might be given a word and you think, actually, I need to give a word for that person in the office. Do it. Just see what happens. Just be like, hey, no, it sounds really weird, but can I share this? If words are not your thing and you think, actually, that person looks really sad um, or they just look a bit upset, what can I do to cheer them up? Can I write them a note? One of the girls in, um, at uni, when um, I was having a really bad day and I was struggling, she just wrote a note that she just said, keep your chin up, Jesus loves you, and just stuck it on my desk. And God spoke through that, and I thought, wow, like, she didn't even need to say anything. And for her thing, it wasn't speaking, it was just, I just needed to write something. I just needed to do something for you to hear from God. And so I just want to encourage you, in your every day, just step out, let's do these things. Because why? We want to bring the kingdom of heaven down. We want to see people encounter Jesus. And I'm loving the young people in the fact that they say, we want people to encounter Jesus. Because when you encounter Jesus, you can't deny it. We're getting to a stage in the world where we can, we can preach and we can preach and we should still do this because there's power in the word. But people need to experience God for themselves. And when they do, there's almost just like a no denying that actually God met with me. So we're going to pray to receive gifts. We've got about well, 10 minutes or so. So would you like to just stand?